You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Common Descent Podcast. Ba -ba -da -ba. We This episode is all about responding to the survey. Indeed. So across the month of March, we had a listener survey out, and hopefully you, dear listener, responded to it. Lots of people did. If you didn't, we'll do another one sometime in the future. Yes. But it was so fun. We got so many great responses that we wanted to take some time to talk about some of the things we learned at the survey and some of the things that we are thinking about changing or adding or, you know. Updates. Updates. Basically, some of the... This is episode's basically for some of the behind-the-scenes glimpses at, you know, what we're thinking about doing uh, as it relates to the things that came up in the survey. The other thing that happened on the survey is that we put that question right at the end of the survey. Just for fun. That just, just for fun. Just we for said, fun. if you could ask us a question, what would it be? And neither one of us thought very hard about that question. No, it, we literally, it was like a side comment. It was like, hey, we should put a, and we called it a bonus question. Yeah. And, and that was the question we thought the least about. We put yep. it in there, spent a lot of time on the rest of the, the, the survey, <laughs> never thought about that again. But like 40 or so people responded <laughs> and asked us questions. Yeah. So the second section of this survey bonus response episode is going to be us answering the questions that people asked. Absolutely. In that section. So if you uh, want to hear about some of that sort of peek behind the curtain, things that we're thinking about stuff, then keep listening. If you just want to get to the question, the Q&A part. Jump to like 30 minutes or so. Yep, that's what we're going to aim for. Probably around there. So, yeah, that's going to be the longer part. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is going to be a long This is going to be a long episode. It's, I think. That's a lot of good questions. But let's start uh, and go through some of the, the survey feedback. Um, we are not going to be able to talk about everything that came up in the survey. No. Uh, so if you made a comment and we don't mention it here, fret not. We did read everything. Yes, and... First and foremost, thank you all for your responses because you guys gave some amazing responses. Yes, we really, really appreciate the people taking the time to do this. Indeed, uh, and it's it was so it's so nice to hear people because and this is something that one of the reasons we did the survey is that for the most part our listeners are invisible to us. Yeah, we, there are some people on social media who interact with us, and that's wonderful. And we have a few, we, you know, there's a bunch of people on Patreon, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But that's a fraction of the number of downloads we get. So there's a huge invisible, there's a, there's the dark matter. The, as, as the phrase, <laughs> the silent majority. The silent majority. Yes. The dark matter of our podcast mm -hmm. listeners. Our, imagine if you will, a dark audience. <laughs> 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 so there's a number of things we heard in the podcast survey. Uh, there are a number of things that kind of were ended up being equivocal. Yeah, it was it was kind of fun seeing <laughs> what things got brought up. Uh, so some, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, really quick, I just wanted to, for anyone who didn't get a chance to see the survey or fill it out, we had a number of sections. We asked for let us know general things like how you found us, but also what do you like, what could we improve on, and yep. what would you like to see more of, and yep. that those those were the the big points where people were actually able to write in responses and boy did they yes so we got some demographic info mm -hmm. right we know like what sort of the breakdown of our listeners and their background is yeah but there, a bunch of people said they want longer episodes yes a bunch of people said they want shorter episodes all right <laughs> there were a, a number of people said that they love our news section great because it helps them keep up with news uh, other people said that they don't come for the news, they come for the discussion topics. Okay. Some people want us to do more specific topics. Some All people right. really like the broad topics. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, we're probably going to keep the format pretty much the same. <laughs> As if, if anyone knows anything about statistics, when you have 
the <laughs> results going on either side like this, then we're going to go right between the middle for <laughs> our, our yes. mean. So for the most part, the broad strokes of the podcast format are going to remain the same, but stay tuned mm-hmm. for, for addendums. The biggest criticism that we received, and we asked in those words. We did. Criticize us, please. Yes, we did. So it turns out... Yeah? ...that we have some repetitive Uh speech patterns. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. Right. How about that? (laughs) Cool. (laughs) A number... Interesting. A number (laughs) of people, many people, pointed out that we... We make a lot of those sorts of words and noises. <laughs> we we get a little bit overzealous with our repetitive <laughs> one monosyllabic responses. We have taken this to heart we and we will be monitoring our speech yes. in the future. It One of the biggest reasons for that is when we are recording the episode, and we've said this to a degree, it really is almost beat for beat the same kind of conversations we have anyway. <laughs> so yes, it has it some is. very organic um, after effects <laughs> yeah. of that. And the kind of stuff you don't, that, that I never thought about until it was being recorded. Yep. <laughs> but that's part of, uh, honestly, that's part of the difference between doing a, some you know, something for an audience and something that's just two people hanging out in a living room. Oh, absolutely. So that, uh, in all seriousness, we greatly appreciate those kinds of feedbacks. There were also a number of things that people said they want to see us do or want to see us change. Their wish lists. Um, A number of people asked us to do more episodes. Which? Like, you know, more frequent Mm -hmm. episodes. Uh, Some people want more specific in-depth topics. A bunch of people said they want to hear from more guest episodes. Yeah, it was a a cool to see how much people really enjoyed getting to hear other people in the field and related to the field. Yes. And there were a number of commenters who asked if we would consider doing video content. Yeah. Uh, Now, if you've been keeping up with all of our stuff, you will know that we have actually started dabbling in video content a little bit. Yes, we have. We did a couple of live streams, so check those out on YouTube if you haven't. Yep, they've been saved as, as videos for you to watch anytime now. Yes. But the general response, basically anytime people asked us to do more of something, Mm -hmm. our sort of shared response is, we agree with that, but But. we are limited. We are limited by time and money. Time and money are the the two major things. Uh, This is is in many ways acting as a part-time job for us. And for me, that would be my second job next to a a nine-to-seven yeah <laughs> and then yeah david writes and so we we have other things that we have to do to keep living where we're living and eating what we're eating yes so that's not to say we won't do those things and not once again all. stay tuned mm-hmm. we have we have some plans cooking that are are there to specifically hopefully fulfill some of these requests trying to do a little bit of both yeah but on this note There is something that you all can do to make this wish come true. It's very (laughs) simple. If you go to a a real convenient website (laughs) called Patreon. (laughs) Patreon.com slash Common Sense Podcast. In all honesty, you know, it's it's funny and it's sort of that plug, you know, give us money sort of plug. Nudge, nudge, huh? But Patreon has been a huge help for us. and, And it is... Part of the reason that we are able to be thinking about mm-hmm. doing some of these additional things. Uh, but th- and, and that's just to give people an explanation as to why, why we set the limit that we set when we started. Every two weeks. Um, guest episodes are another one of those things that they're just, they're harder to do. They're more work. They're more time. They're more effort. There's a whole new it's, level of complications that are on top by adding another person that you know, we we don't necessarily know that well yet. Yeah, well, that that isn't used to this that isn't format <laughs> that we have that has to do their own recording. And then there's an extra bit of editing we have mm-hmm. to do. And it it's just that little bit of extra that takes time and it takes effort. Uh, but knowing that these are the sorts of things that people want has guided. Again, we're keep an eye out. 
we're because when the time comes for us to start doing new stuff, we will be looking at these requests. Yes, and we, that won't be too far in the like I said, we're already doing video stuff absolutely. a little bit. We made a very detailed list of of the things people were hoping to see and requesting. Yes, uh, and we we actually just talked to another guest not too long ago. Yeah, and we've we've got some plans that will hopefully satisfy some of these requests. Another thing that came up a few times is that there are a bunch of people that asked if we could put more uh, more substance into the blog posts. Make it a little a little meatier. And that in terms of yeah, 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 in terms of more content, or at least more specific targeted content, and also just making the blog look nicer. At least one person said I think there were a couple of people who said that they wish the blog was just a better blog, and not necessarily in like a a rude way. No, just, Nobody was rude on the on the survey. They, they, but just like yeah, you could it could look better. It could be advertised more, you know, sta- general stuff. Yeah, they would. They would like to see a a blog that matches the the efforts we put into the podcast and shows yes. that. And that's another one of those things that's it's it's another expenditure of time and effort. But it's also for a long time we didn't know that anybody was reading the blog, so it's actually really nice to get this feedback. Yeah, we we had been actively under the assumption that we weren't getting much interaction on the blog so Mm -hmm. most people must not be reading it and i mean if no one's reading it, it's just a drain on time and so finding this out was very illuminating yeah and you'll if you go through our blog archive you'll see how our approach to the blog posts has kind of waxed and waned as we try to find the perfect format um But keeping in mind the stuff that people say that they get out of the blog, things like additional references, things like um, like some of the the stuff that directly supplements what we're saying and referring to in the episodes, we are we're we're zeroing in on, I think, our ultimate format for the blog. So those of you who do read the blog and do follow the blog, keep an eye on it and let us know. Keep letting us know what you want to see in regards to any of these things. If we put something in in it at one point that you really enjoyed, flag it so that we know to do that again next time. Because for us, that may have just been a trial. Yes. So if, it, if you like what you're seeing, let us know. If you don't like what you're seeing, let us know. Indeed. There were also a handful of suggestions people made that were really quick and simple. Yes. Uh, musical interludes was something that people asked for and are now part of the podcast. Because we liked that idea, too. Good idea. So there you go. A- effective change. Something <laughs> nice and simple. <laughs> One person asked if we could be on Spotify. And the answer is apparently yes. Uh, hypothetically. Has, hypothetically, in theory. We're, we might even be on Spotify by the time you hear this. <laughs> uh, we have clicked the button on Podbean that says start putting us on Spotify. Uh, it's still under review as of this recording, but hopefully that'll go through. I don't foresee any issues with that. Also, one person asked if we could put timestamps in the podcast descriptions. So basically, like, the news starts here, the discussion starts here, in case you want to jump ahead. In case you don't want to listen to the news or something, you can jump ahead to the discussion. Identify the sections. Yes. And that, boy, that sure seems like a quick and simple thing to do. Yeah, we, that sounded like a cool idea. Wouldn't it, yeah, wouldn't it be great if that could happen? We're, we're looking into it. As it turns out, you would think that time would be universal. Evidently, like, it's relative or something. Yeah, know. something about relativity. <laughs> um, a timestamp on the Podbean upload does not, like, if you go to 20 minutes exactly, in Podbean, it is not the same part of the episode as it is on iTunes, which is also not the same as it is on YouTube at 20 minutes. So I, we're hesitant to put a timestamp in the podcast description, because then if you listen to it on iTunes or YouTube or something, the timestamp's going to be wrong. And I feel like I'd rather have no timestamps than obnoxiously wrong timestamps. So that's something... We're I'm gonna we'll keep looking into po- possibilities for that. Yeah, still still hoping to find a 
solution that might give an, an easier fix than time stamping every single episode individually three times. Yeah. So so if anybody out there has a suggestion as to how to get around that issue, let us know. We are all ears. All of them. All the ears. We're, I, you know, we're learning. We're figuring <laughs> this stuff out as it goes. This isn't the first time somebody has asked us to do a thing that we didn't know we could do. This happened on Patreon. Somebody asked if we could make a patron-specific RSS feed so that patrons could get all the bonus audios. Yeah, and, and, and once again, we had a moment of like, oh, that, that sounds like a cool idea. And then went, oh, well, then click, click. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it turns <laughs> out that's like two clicks on Patreon. So awesome. <laughs> you Let us know because we don't know what we're doing all the time. We're, we're learning how to internet every day. <laughs> Uh, there were some other suggestions that came up in the survey. Um, a couple mentions of merchandise, which, yeah. Yeah. I, we could do that. What do you guys want? <laughs> what would be interesting? Absolutely. One person offered, ad- one person I think just said, do you guys need any advice <laughs> on merch? The answer is, yeah, absolutely. Send us, <laughs> send us whatever you, whatever suggestions you have. Well, yeah, that uh, if, if that's something that we can do. We, we will sort through it, collate it, and make a decision. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So if people want merchandise type stuff, let us know. We would love to look into to more ways to get stuff out to you to you folks. It lets us be kind of crafty, too. So Yes, it's, it does. It's fun to get to make stuff. Yeah, we are, so any anytime people have advice on something or a suggestion for something they'd like to see... Always let us know. The, the survey was sort of a streamlined, burst version of that. Uh, but we're open to that anytime. Yeah, just because you may not have been able to respond to the survey does not mean you do not get to let your voice be heard. Send us. You can, you can even send us in a format of your own survey response. We will not care. We'll be <laughs> happy to hear it. The survey was just something we wanted to be able to gather together and actually look through as a more organized data supply. Yes. And in the end, we feel like we have a better sense of who's listening, or at least a better sense of who likes us enough to respond to a survey. <laughs> it's the, our it's our listeners who are more talkative. <laughs> yeah, it's a biased sample, and that's <laughs> that's impossible to get around. But a uh, better sense of what who's listening and what our listeners want. So like we said, um, we're not going to be jumping to weekly episodes. Um, We're not going to do a ton more video content right away, but the time will come and it will be coming. Some of these things will be coming in the next several months uh, where we start doing new things or we start, you know, experimenting with some new stuff like our live streaming. And these suggestions are what we're going to be keeping in mind. So, the, the responses we got here were a very pleasant mixture of confirming things we were already trying to accomplish, to know that we were meeting our personal goals on what the podcast was hoped to be, finding out unexpected things that people enjoyed or would like or had noticed, and then also having those fun moments of people suggesting things and us both having a, were you listening <laughs> were you in the room because yeah <laughs> yeah well and then also s- some parts where we had because we've had conversations in the past of like all right what you know if, if yes. we do something new what would be the first new thing we'd want to experiment yeah, with how, what what else could we expand to yes and we there were a few comments that came out of the survey that some of them were Yes, an excuse to do that thing we wanted to do. <laughs> well, if you ask for it, okay. <laughs> but then there were others that we were that were not what we would have expected. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting to know. So thank you again to everybody who responded to those questions. So much. And shared your thoughts. And also, because everybody that responded to the survey was super nice about it. They were. They, and they were very articulate. They, they did not. We didn't get any of those. Are you enjoying the part? Yeah. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. yes no. Uh, yeah. Some people answered only a few questions, and that's yeah. fine. You know, you do it however you want. But, but no, we got a lot of detailed answers, very, and very and much. So. Even criticisms were very polite and, and very 
uh, very thought out. So truly, the definition of constructive, because yes. many people who would bring up a criticism or something they had noticed would also have a maybe this. That... Yeah, people gave us advice and suggestions. It was it awesome. was great. So yeah. thank so you, this thank is... you, thank you. Yeah. I, we finished this survey, and my immediate thought was, I can't wait until next year. Yep. To where we could do another survey. Yep. <laughs> can't get here soon enough. So thanks once again for that. Uh, if you want to continue to support our efforts and get us towards getting those new things that, that you want us to achieve, uh, keep listening. Keep letting us know what you think. And if you'd like to push us along a little more, as always... You may join us on Patreon, and we would be immensely grateful. Internally. Forever in your debt. <laughs> now, on to the next segment. At the end of the survey, we said, if you could ask us any question, what would it be? And a ton of people asked us questions. Yeah. So we have put together the lists. Uh, we can't attribute the questions to anybody because these are anonymous surveys. So we're just going to be reading the questions. Hopefully you'll hear your question. Uh, some of the questions, we've rephrased them a little bit to, you know, to cut them down for the, the podcast. Or we've uh, uh, combined some similar questions. Yes. So you might not hear your question exactly word for word, but they're all... Hopefully you will get here. the answer you were looking for. Yes. Now, but what I'm going to do right now is randomize the list. Yeah. Because that's fun. Oh, that's a good first one. Okay. So we're going to... randomized it. Go ahead. And now we're going to take turns. We'll read one, and the other will take the chance answering it. Boom, yep. there it is. And now, and we'll go through... We're going to go through these kind of speed round because there's a good few of them and we are both long winded. So it's, it, it, we, need, we yes. need to adjust for time as much as possible. We're going to lightning round this just a little bit. This is our first sort of mailbag episode. So this will be a lot of fun. Yeah. Common Descent Podcast Q&A starts now. Will, would you like to kick us off? I would. And this is a good one to start with. Question number one, who really won the snakes versus crocs debate? We need a round two. <laughs> the answer is obviously obvious. Crocs. Yeah. Snakes. Wait a minute. <laughs> I thought it was pretty clear. <laughs> there will there will be a round two yes. coming soon. Yes, there Stay will. Stay tuned, <laughs> as I'm now very fond of saying. <laughs> Question number two. What paleontological journal should I get a subscription to? Good question. I'm I'm gonna defer to you because you have more experience writing. Sure, yeah. So you have you know the ins and outs of the journals. Indeed. I, honestly, I would say that there are a ton of open access paleontology journals, which means you don't have to subscribe to them. You can just read them for free. Uh, Paleontologica Electronica is all online. Um, the Bulletin of the American Museum of Natural History. It has a lot of paleo, and that's open access. There's a bunch of open access paleo. If you Google open access paleontology, you'll find a bunch of different journals that you can just read those papers online. And then if you really want to start looking into the other journals, you can find... There's a ton of paleo journals. There's the a lot. Journal of Vertebrate Paleo. There's, there's, just the, there's P3. There's a bunch. There's a whole bunch. You can look them up. But most journals, you can subscribe for email alerts. So when a new issue comes out, they'll send you the list of the titles. And from the titles, you can look at the abstracts. And that's a great way to sample a bunch of journals if you're really hoping to start subscribing and, and, and paying money towards these to support those institutions and get those journals. Get a bunch of email alerts on a bunch of uh, scientific journals and then you know, do that for a few months and then subscribe to your favorites. Yeah, that, that's that's definitely there's there's so many options. Cool. All right, what made you decide to start the podcast? Why is it important to both of you? We decided to start the podcast. Part of it was that I had been listening to a lot of podcasts and I was feeling inspired, mm -hmm. and I started noticing the similarity between some of my favorite podcasts and just the conversations that Will and I had. <laughs> And I said, we could do that. We could just start recording these conversations and put them out there. 
that's almost word for word the way we it was first said <laughs> yeah so why don't we just record this it's also very i i science communication for me has always been a little bit selfish in that i find the best and this isn't unique to me that the best way to learn stuff is to teach it yes so one of the things we said was we'd love to be keeping up more with the news now that we're out of school and we're not actively researching Yep. So we made a news section in the podcast. Yep. So this forces us to be up to date on news, and it also allows us to to be educational about it. Uh, same thing with the topics. Like every topic we do on the podcast, we get to learn about that topic. So yep. it's yeah. There's there it, for me at least. There's a there's a little bit of selfish <laughs> lean to it. Uh, but we both. This is what we do, right? We we love talking to people. We love teaching people about science, and we 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 quite enjoy talking to each other. And we we it's one of the things that we both feel is a true priority in this day and age to have a a actual understanding and true communication about science. Yes, that's the other thing. Is you, you know we want people to have not I don't say role models because that's a little self aggrandizing. But, you know, ex you know, things out there to look to for new information. Reliable and, and sources. Reliable sources, critical thinking, mm -hmm. scientific conversations. That was the other thing. Yes. Is our conversations are just two scientists chatting. And this was one of my favorite things at the end of the, the sloth chat that we just did in the live stream. Yes. Was it was just because the two, our two sloth guys knew each other. Mm -hmm. And they were bickering back and forth, you know, jokingly. <laughs> and it was just scientists having conversations. And I think that that's really important for people to get to hear. What it science just, actually sounds like. Yes. What humans, you know, <laughs> who happen to also know a lot about science or work in science. Yes. Next question. This is a classic <laughs> all the way from the Reddit school of questioning. Would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? 100 duck-sized horses any time for very specific reason. <laughs> I work in an aquarium. I have interacted with ducks. A horse-sized duck is just a flat-faced theropod. <laughs> they are terrifying. <laughs> At that size, it would just dismember you. I agree 100%. <laughs> I would add to that... That a hundred duck-sized horses, a hundred anything is rough. Yeah. But it, I'm pretty sure that a horse that size, I could outrun long enough to climb up something. Yep. Yep. And once I've climbed up something, those horses are SOL. Hooves do not and help. I just, <laughs> just climb up a tree, grab a branch, and start swinging down. <laughs> Go away. That's it. Done. <laughs> To back this one up, would you it then rather... This is a separate question. Yeah. <laughs> rather fight 100 com Comsignathus-sized Diplodocus or one Diplodocus-sized Comsignathus? So Comsignathus is a very small two-legged dinosaur. Early, These early. were the, the, the compies from Jurassic Park, The yes, Lost World. Yes, there you go. Even though in the book, I think they were pro Comsignathus. I think so. But whatever. And Diplodocus is among the largest sauropods, Huge. right? A hundred foot long, long neck, long tail. My answer to this one is actually the opposite. Uh, now, because you could argue the same thing mm -hmm. that I could definitely outrun a hundred oh, yes, yes. this size Diplodocus. But if we're sticking to physics, <laughs> this is true. A Comsignathus scaled up to be like 40 tons is not moving. It's not. It's not. It's going to break its legs and fall over, and I win. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. If the physics don't apply, though, that is a kaiju. <laughs> yeah, no, if, if, we're, if we're ignoring physics, then definitely the tiny deflection. That is a kaiju. I, will, I don't even think I'd need to run. i just start kicking. Yeah. I would just take what it What are they going to do? I mean, like a horse can bite. Honestly, if I, if yeah. it, with either of the hundred size, hundred small sized animals, I'm just going to build a pin and keep them. <laughs> at least save one and sell it even if they hate me all i have to do is keep my fingers <laughs> clear but you feel you build a two foot high fence around you have you have the best attraction ever <laughs> well, and can you like like yeah a horse can bite yeah but a diplot a, a comsignathus sized diplodocus its mm. head's gonna be super tiny <laughs> nom, 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 nom. yeah is this little, what are you gonna do to me <laughs> the tail may yeah the tail might hurt but yeah. ow ow stop it <laughs> cut out next question 
Should I go for a master's in paleontology? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> we both did it, and we both yes. enjoyed it. Uh, yes. It was what I, I knew before I ever finished undergrad, getting my bachelor's, that I was going to get my master's. Same here. Because I was not done with school yet. I could feel it. I was not done learning, and I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a paleontologist. If you are truly passionate about it, it is super duper rewarding, but it's work. Yes, it is. And it's a grind and often it requires research. And if you're not a researcher it, 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 in your heart, <laughs> yeah, research is very, very tedious and tough, but it's, it's, I have some of my best memories from my time at grad school. Uh, many of my friends that I, I still know to this day, I met during that time. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, I have no regrets about it, but yeah, it's, it's a investment both monetarily and time-wise. It is. And, and I think that people shouldn't think that they need to get a master's to be involved in paleo. Very good point. Absolutely. But also not think that they need to avoid getting a master's for any reason. Yes. If you can afford it, you know, honestly, look at master's programs, talk to People who run master's programs. Yeah. Call up some professors, ask them what you'll be expected to do, and ask them what the program's like. That's the best way. Because every person's situation and every program is going to be a little yes. different. It's it's going to be different everywhere you go. All, All right. right. Do your research. After doing the research, if you feel like you would really want to do it, then yeah, do it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Live your dreams. Oh, it's yes, absolutely. 100%. All right. Have you ever considered visiting universities to talk about science communication? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, I actually did. I actually yes, uh, yes. Skyped into uh, Chris Widka's grad students class the other day. Well, a little while ago now to talk about SciCom. Mm hmm. A hundred percent. Uh, we would love to, to, to go around to places and talk to people about SciCom or science or anything. Uh, uh, one of the most, paradoxical attributes that I've discovered about my own personality is that I feel right at home in front of a crowd of people yeah. talking about stuff. Um, if I'm not the one, if I'm not the center of attention, I don't even want to be in the room, but <laughs> if I'm the center of attention, absolutely. It's, what do you want um, me to talk about? Yeah. Bring it on. Y'all looking at me. Awesome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if there are opportunities out there to the person who asked this question, tell us where you want to go. This was, <laughs> well, Brings, set us up with some room and board and we'll show up. This is one of our, our, our very first original ideas for next step uh, mm -hmm. after starting the podcast was do episodes and then start going places. And so yeah, this, this, so this was something we talked about a while ago. Next question. Are there any topics you are uninterested in covering? I really was. I found this question fascinating. It is. Baseline answer? No, not really. Nope. There's, there's no... We are both of the opinion that nothing is uninteresting, especially if it is talked about by someone who is interested in it. Yes, 100%. Everything, I would happily learn exactly how a printer works if someone who truly knew it, and an engineer who really <laughs> was passionate about it, explained it to me. I'd be very interested. Yeah. With that said, there are definitely topics that we are hesitant to cover Usually because either our lack of knowledge on it, a bacteria yeah. episode would be very daunting for us. <laughs> that's why we take guests. And that's why we take guests. So there are no episodes we're uninterested. There are definitely ones that may take longer or not show up as often because they're not what we get pumped about or they're not ones that we can easily do just the two of us. Or it's that it if we could do it just the two of us, but we'd have to do a lot of background oh, research. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's more time and it takes a while. And so, yeah, but we're interested. In, the only addendum I would add to that is that there is a certain topic of conversation that's going to come up around mid-June this year <laughs> that I'm not particularly <laughs> looking forward to having to talk about. He's dragging we're gonna his have feet to on. Talk about it anyway. Uh, all right. this I lost track of whose turn it was. How often Your turn. do you guys, us guys, meet us up guys. in real life? I, the last time we met in person, that we actually physically saw each other, I believe was PAX East. PAX East. 2016. Yep. Which was what, May or April? 
in yes. spring. It was sometime in the spring. Almost, yeah, almost exactly two years ago now. Jeez. Yep. So there you go. It's been two years. <laughs> Often enough. Often, Often enough. enough. <laughs> Uh, and hopefully again sometime soon. But yes. No, yeah, we've been internet friends now for two years. Yep, yep. <sighs> Next question. Can you speculate on the future evolutionary trajectory of snakes and crocs? What's it? Will? Crocs? <laughs> <laughs> Baseline answer? Not really. It's, that's... <laughs> yeah, that's it. Nope, moving on. Nope, not. We can't really. But yeah, I do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely have thoughts about it. Uh, there's lots of cool things. M the one I think of most often is my the silver lining part for me of global warming is that if we get a bunch of shallow oceans, I, that we will get true marine crocs again as yeah. things like saltwater crocodiles and you know, the, the estuarian crocodiles and the American crocodiles start to spread out their territories into the warmer areas into shallow places with lots of islands that we could actually see some a boom in their population and things like that uh yeah and my my mad scientist goal has forever been to rebreed terrestrial galloping crocodiles you yes you've spent so much time thinking about whether or not you can <laughs> I, i've <laughs> i've thought through the mechanics a little bit i know which species i'd use first <laughs> as far as snakes uh, what you said about, you know, as climate shifts, mm -hmm. they'll probably expand, you know, the majority of reptiles are limited to the tropics in this, the cold times. <laughs> in the but dark honest, times. In the dark, dark times. Honestly, I can't imagine snakes evolving anything too crazy in the future, only because they haven't really evolved anything too crazy. Like, that, that is a very specific body plan. And they've done a ton of stuff with it. Like, they live everywhere. They That's... live in the oceans. They live all over the place. But I don't really imagine snakes are, you know, it's been a hundred million years, and they've pretty much looked like snakes that whole time. Well, that's that's what I was about to say. Like I was saying with the crocs, my, the things I predict are things we might have already seen with snakes. Yeah, we might see something weird, but to look through the list of weird stuff they've already done. Yeah, <laughs> like, basically. You know, another gliding one? I don't <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know that they're gonna, you know, achieve flight. Bummer. So, but, but one can dream. <laughs> what can we do to help get the word out about your show? Uh, tell your friends. The number one, the number one, uh, when we asked people how they learned about us on the survey, uh, well, number one was searching for it, but if I remember correctly, the second highest thing, the second highest answer was that they heard about us from friends and family. Talk to people, uh, share our posts on social media, if you would, and leave reviews on iTunes. Yes. Like, like and review on iTunes, because we don't we do not do a whole ton of work directly with iTunes, but iTunes is like the big podcast juggernaut in the room. It is. If, you can, if we can get likes and reviews and, and stuff, like, and, 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 and downloads from iTunes, iTunes puts you higher up on the, the visibility lists, the more attention you're getting. Yes. So, like and subscribe, listeners. Like and subscribe. Next question. How do you write a paper? That's a really good question. And I feel like if you you would get almost a different answer for every single researcher that you asked this <laughs> question to, because everyone that's probably going to have their own slight techniques. There's definitely layouts, and there's tons of tutorials. Like, if you are looking to do your own writing, you can find things that give you here are the key things you want to include. Here are the key things that you need to have. And yep. there's definitely my biggest hurdle is wording of things. You have to make sure mm -hmm. you're wording in a very clear and concise, you know, understandable way of speaking, even if it's science jargony. Uh, my technique personally is I, I basically have to write it once to get it down. And then I have to redo it for a second draft almost, almost from scratch, but just rewriting it now with that first draft in my head yeah because without getting it out that first time i get so stuck if i'm like all right abstract first get it perfect i i get so stuck because i don't know what the rest of it looks like yet in my own head and so yeah. i i use the draft process very aggressively i have like three to four to five drafts by the time i finish a big paper there's also the point that different scientific publications have different format requirements yeah 
So a lot of the how to write a paper, a lot of that's decided for you. This is very true. Uh, but realistically, you'll read enough papers in researching your scientific paper that you will have a very good sense of what a paper looks like by the time you're ready to write your own. Absolutely. So, David. Yes? Would you do an episode on birds? Why, yes, I would. In fact, stay tuned, listeners. <laughs> Next up, are either of you Canadian? I feel like I can sense it, says this person. <laughs> If not, what would your careers be like if you weren't in paleo? Cool. First, no, we're not Canadian. We're not Canadian, eh? No. He's closest. No. I'm clo I'm like, I've spent the majority of my life within seven or eight hours of Canada. No, I'm... I'm That's it. I'm a Georgia boy, born and bred. I, I was born there and lived all my life there until I, I met David in Tennessee. So that was, that, was the, <laughs> yes. that was the first time I lived outside of the state was grad school. Yep. So, nah... But the second part is very interesting. I ha I had a very brief moment in undergrad where even though I was a biology student, because I knew I liked that better than everything else, I was tempted and started to pursue acting, specifically comedy and voiceover. Yeah. And so I, I, very, I for a moment, was wanting to go that. I even had the idea of I wanted to go through school and get my degree and so that I could be a paleontologist and then I'd go do comedy. <laughs> Just uh, it's like, all right, I got this now on to the next side mission. Your parents must have been thrilled. Like, <laughs> I'm going to get all right, mom and dad, I'm going to get a job in this super obscure <laughs> realm of science. Uh, do you have a backup? Yeah, come. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing was, I actually told that to the interviewers <laughs> when yeah. I was at g applying for college and I got the program. <laughs> hey, there you go. Honestly, this, is this the key, kid's people. got moxie. <laughs> <laughs> I have long said that if I were not in science, uh, I probably still would have gone down an academic route, and it there's a good chance it would have been linguistics. I yeah, that that would have been my bet. I love I love it. I love language stuff. <laughs> All right, so this is this is a, a back on a country subject. What country beside the United States would you want to go to? to dig and collect research. Uh, I have actually done this. Yes. I have gone to another country to dig and collect research, and my immediate answer is that I would go back to China. Yeah. I loved being in China. It was so much fun. when I went, Especially because uh, one of the reasons that Jim Mead and I started working on China stuff was... So my some of the research that I started with Jim uh, during my master's, another bonus of a master's is you start projects, we started studying lizards and snakes from the Pleistocene cave deposits in southern China. And one of the reasons that we did that is because no one has done that. There's nobody, and nobody with a little asterisk, like maybe a couple people, but I, I fairly certain our research was, if not the first, among the very first people to do any sort of serious study of, of lizards and snakes from China. Very cool. China is a country that the U.S. sort of had its big heyday of paleontology in the late 1800s, moving on to the beginning of the 1900s. And nowadays, we're very comfortably, like, we we know where all the good stuff is. Yes. We keep going back there. We keep finding stuff. China is one of the countries that's only in the recent decades started building their own paleontological resources. So there's that's, all sorts of opportunities. That's why you, you it seems like every other news thing you see coming out about fossils is a new cool Chinese dinosaur. Yes. See also Argentina, Mongolia. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of places around the world that that's happening in. Yes. Next question. <laughs> is Jack Horner really the most awesome paleontologist ever? This is a razor's edge. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We're not going to be passing judgment no. on our fellow paleontologists. No. And I, I'd say the true answer here is I I do not know that I would rate anyone as the most awesome paleontologist yeah. ever. It's because there's always there's always going to be contention. You know, you'll always have someone that would disagree <laughs> with your <laughs> well, vote, and it's, and it's subjective. <laughs> it's subjective, but also, yeah. so many people have had cool additions and contributions that yeah. trying to place. You know, it, it's it's like saying like yes, you know, like Darwin discovering or coming up with 
uh, the concept of natural selection, but then also that he's the, he's the best biologist ever. Oh, well, yeah, that, that's a, that's, <laughs> he has a really good thing, but there's also some other crazy things that have happened in biology that should be ranked. So yeah. I wouldn't, I'm not going to rank him the most, but I wouldn't <laughs> rank anyone really. Uh, for the record, I met Jack Horner once. I'll tell you the riveting tale. <laughs> I was this sit around, SVP. gather around, I children. Think, I think Los Angeles at SVP one year, and I was looking for paleontologists to ask some questions. I was I was doing some questioning about documentary work, and Jack's been on a ton of documentaries. So I found him in the poster session at one point. And I walked right up to him and I said, "Hello." Ja I don't know if I said Jack or Mister Horner or whatever I said. And I said, do you have, I want to ask you some questions about your time, you know, working on documentaries. And he said, well, I'm actually talking to this gentleman at the moment, so I can't, I don't have time right now. And I said, okay, I'll catch up with you later. And that was it. <laughs> That's, that is the extent of the time I've ever talked to Jack Horner. And that was the last time they saw each other. So yeah, he's, he was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Our next question is... Relating to the behind the scenes of growing a SciComm platform, what worked, what hasn't? Oh, well, I everything that we're doing worked. <laughs> That's why we're still doing it. It survived the process. <laughs> um, it's interesting. It's been a big learning experience for us. Huge. Um, I think that a lot of the stuff, I think there's a lot we're not doing. Like, we could always be doing more social media stuff. We could yeah. always be doing more of a lot of things. I'm trying to think if there's something that hasn't worked. Our first... Besides our first attempt at a live <laughs> stream. Was, that was, you were about to say. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was our... our that and, and we we have had, like, technical glitches where we, we've lost, you know, an episode in the past that had to be actually redone. Yes, we, we have. Ha we had one that we decided to redo just because we were we were both just not at our our A game <laughs> when yeah. we did it. It was just rough. <laughs> so we've we've had moments of stumbles, but not not like a technique that came back to bite us or something. Uh I would say what works is talking and listening to your audience. Yes. Know your audience. That's why we did the survey in the first place. And what I can't, yeah, I can't think of anything that we like struck out on. Yeah, not to say that we, you know, we just, it's just been winning all day. But yeah, everything's coming up us. Yep, but I, I, I ha we haven't had a moment, and it's partially because we, we are, we also, this is another part of what works, communicate with each other. So if you are working with people, we yes. set up regular meetings. Like we will, we will set up a time to Skype and just to talk about. All right, what do we want? How do we want to do this next thing? When are we doing it? What are we aiming for? And yeah. sharing ideas. Poke, you know, when someone, when one of us says something to, for the other one to be able to go, I, I don't quite like that to this. Yeah. And so w hashing it out before jumping in. So that I'd say that's probably the reason we haven't had something just come back to really bite us is because we try to have a unified idea before we go in. Yes, we make a plan, we stick to it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Next question. What small things do you do to add joy to your lives? Oh, so many. <laughs> I, what I, a question. It's, Jeez. That's such man. a good question. And it's, man, that made me feel warm and fuzzy the first time I read it. It's, uh, I could not list the amount of things. I am a, a collector of hobbies. Uh, <laughs> if you were to see my, my place of residence, I have at least four or five different mini collections going at any different time. And I bounce from hobby to hobby. I do miniatures. I do Legos. I do, uh, I went through a time when Spore came out and I cannot count how many Spore creatures I made. I, <laughs> I like to tinker is really the bottom line answer to that. If I can do something yeah. with my hands that's detailed and minute, that's what I do. I do very much the same thing, but in the, uh, mental sense <laughs> the realms of the mind like i come up with a creative idea and i open a word document and i write down a bunch of fun ideas <laughs> and then i leave it and that's it it has it has lent itself well to uh running dungeons and dragons yes yes it has <laughs> <laughs> also i have a podcast and that's super fun oh this has been a great outlet for a lot of these things yeah very cool next question 
in how many ways is the Tufts Love T-Rex skull a better skull than Sue? <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, David. Yeah, so uh, Sue is the famous T-Rex uh, from out west. Well, they're all from out west. Uh, at the Field Museum. <laughs> Tufts Love came out of Montana. I'm suddenly unsure about that, but I'm pretty sure it was Montana. Not too long ago is another T-Rex skull. I don't know that that one is better than the other. I haven't, looked, you know, I'm not a T-Rex researcher and I haven't uh, examined them up close. I do know that the Tufts Love skull is younger than Sue. Not younger, like, geologically, but ontogenetically. And you know what that word means now, because we did an episode about it. <laughs> it's a younger skull, which means it can tell us potentially different things about the life stages of the uh, of the species. I also, I'm pretty sure Tufts Love is still being prepped. Still. It's not it's not fully prepped out yet. So I think that the, the future studies will tell us uh, more about the, the specific differences between those two skulls. So stay tuned to the real world. <laughs> Next up, what are some great evolution or paleontology-based books, preferably audiobooks? That's a really good question. And there there are definitely some cool ones. Uh, the, uh, what was it? Your Inner Fish? Uh, yes. I couldn't remember if it was book. your or my. Uh, yeah, your Inner Fish. Your Inner Fish is... is one of the big ones that you'll often hear about that was very cool. It's it's focusing on the discovery of Tiktaalik, the the yeah. quote unquote first fish, or uh, or not first fish, first um, the first amphibian. Amphibian, thank you. Yeah. The, the first, last fish. The last fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first amphibian. Uh, the alliteration got away with me. First tetrapod, I guess. Yes, yeah, is, is better. Exactly, yeah. and so it goes through their discovery, but also discusses the specifics of the fossil and the specimen, and it's a very cool one. Yeah, and there it is in audiobook format. Yes. What's the uh, yeah. all of all, all of my yesterdays, all of my, oh, all yesterdays, all yesterdays. Thank you. That's uh, Nation Conway and Coastman. That sounds right. I think I think is the third name. Yeah, that's what I have actually not got to read this one yet. You have a copy, correct? I do. I don't think there's an audiobook, but it's mostly about art. And so, so it'd be hard to make a whole lot of sense on this page. You'll see. Um, yes, <laughs> but this. But no, one, that's a fantastic book, and it's it's about paleo art and the the pitfalls that it is easy to get trapped by when drawing extinct creatures and some of the habits that have formed that the the authors are pointing out really should be left by the wayside for actual observations instead of just because it was done once in a really cool way. Yes, uh, very cool book. So there's there's a bunch of them out there. Those are the first two that come to mind for me. Cool. David, once again, yes. where do you stand now that we've established uh, Tufts Love T-Rex? Where do you stand on the validity of Nano Tyrannus? Please <laughs> well, clarify. Well, yeah. So, dear listeners, Nano Tyrannus is a genus <coughs> of Tyrannosaur <laughs> that is basically looks like a small version of T-Rex. And has been argued by many to be a juvenile T-Rex, not actually a different species. And not a small There's a, version of, but just a small T-Rex. An actual <laughs> small version. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a few specimens of Nanotyrannus. And this, the, the people have been arguing back and forth over this for a while as to whether or not it is legit. I hesitate to make firm stances because, again, I'm not a Tyrannosaur expert. And I don't like, <laughs> I don't like making claims like i know what i'm talking about no on specific things like that because i haven't looked at it i can tell you that it would not surprise me if it were a juvenile tyrannosaur yes. and if you put a gun to my head that my guess would be that it was it's a juvenile tyrannosaurus if i've always forced uh, to bet on it yeah and more of the theropod researchers that i've spoken with fall on that side of the argument that they they think that it's probably a juvenile tyrannosaur but there are people out there who are very staunch defenders of the idea that it's its own taxon so we shall see but uh, uh, more expert people than i are arguing over it as we speak yes hey will yeah how badly did you guys us how badly did you want to live in dinotopia asks this person i loved those books growing up they add so badly <laughs> so badly i still have them on my shelf right now yeah i used to have a bunch i love i still own them to this day for so many reasons one 
cool concept. You get to live alongside dinosaurs, many of which are now smart enough to, for you to communicate with. Yes. But the world building in those books was so well done. There was a map. I loved looking at the map. There was a map. They had a language. I yeah. used to write things. I used to write things in the footprint language. Me too. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I would do that too. They had their own mythologies. My favorite, my favorite part, just because I didn't know this was a thing. I learned about this actual technique in Dinotopia was when they talked about having to raise orphan dinosaurs and using puppets of the adult mother to make sure that the dinosaurs still see their own kind as their own kind. Yeah. Which is something we really do with some orphan animals like cranes, usually with birds that imprint. They will either mm -hmm. wear disguises that look like the bird or some <laughs> will dress th things like trees so that they at least don't see humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that way when they go released back to the wild, they're still wild. And I learned about that in Dinotopia. So I, I love them. And when they introduced the world beneath with the steampunk robot mech dinosaurs that's that was i was done i was smitten one thing that i used to do when i was a kid is when i really liked something I, tv shows or books i would create my own like in my head i would create my own stories of me as a character yes in yes, that world yes so i had that with dinosaurs like if i were in dinotopia this would be my story <laughs> and every now and then i'd be reading that something and a chapter would inspire me and I'd put the book down for a second and then put in my own made up chapter in my <laughs> head. Like I'd sit there and be like, okay, what if, what if I were in this world, I would come in at this chapter and this is what I would be doing. Yeah. And most of the time I was the best character ever. Well, yeah. Cause Obviously. I, like, like when I did it with Harry Potter books, I was like a, a prodigy with all the magic. <laughs> Cause of course, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. I mean, why, why, why wouldn't you be <laughs> just like I am in real life? <laughs> We got awesome. a bunch here. We have, so, yeah, we have a little uh, list of similar questions. We'll back and forth. First one is, what are your favorite dinosaurs? Deinonychus. Mine is, I like the weird ones. I like Ceratosaurus, followed very closely by Carnotaurus, because they're predators with horns, and that's weird. <laughs> I had a book. Of one, uh, I had a collection of these dinosaur books, uh, and each book was about a specific dinosaur. Yes, and I remember those. Was, and I had them organized alphabetically on my list, on my, my shelf, because I was a nerd. <laughs> was. I, I, they're not alphabetical anymore. <laughs> now they're organized by author and topic and yeah. uh, they reference books. Or, I left but, that childish stuff behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I left that behind. Jeez, now I organize them by the Dewey Decimal System. The Deinonychus book opened up by describing a bunch of natural disasters in the world of the dinosaurs. It was like dinosaurs had to deal with floods and earthquakes and storms and this and this and this. And then it went, and right up there with all the worst disasters was little Deinonychus. And I had a picture of Deinonychus, and I went, oh, and I was sold. <laughs> and I was, uh, ever since then, was, yes, Deinonychus. <laughs> yeah. The next question in this uh, collection of favorite questions <laughs> which dinosaur is objectively the best crocodiles <laughs> wait a minute hang on a second <laughs> now you're misleading our listeners i know no it's this one is this is one of those where i want to make uh Suko, a, sukamimus yes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> Baryonyx was always up there for me. I loved Baryonyx. Uh, the, the Spinosaurus have that. Oh, they're so cool. And they got yeah. the big old, like, mass murderer claws. Yeah. Um, objectively, the best is hard. It's it, it's real hard not to say theropods, because how can you not like theropods? <laughs> if you're wanting to do by success, birds probably get to hold that title, because they're still around. Yeah. But my they're all really cool. My answer to this question is objectively, like quantitatively. Ooh, yes. The best, ob like, because objectively, the best dinosaur, the most successful species, that is the most diverse, the most numerous, the most widespread species of dinosaur ever to exist, uh, the domestic chicken. Good point. Congratulations, chickens. You hitchhike on the, on the victors of history, and you have become super successful. Stood on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so now with the good ones out of the way what is your most disliked dinosaurs when i was at 
the Center for Science, uh, which we, we had, we not only did educational programs, we had a, an animal uh, uh, area, like we had a bunch of animals that we kept. And there was one day that the sun conures were out. Sun conures are small parakeets. And those sun conures were jerks. <laughs> those are my most disliked dinosaurs. Those three sun conures. Yep. <laughs> they bit me in the ear. <laughs> they flew over and landed on my shoulder. And I was like, oh, oh, this is pretty cool. I didn't realize. Ah, 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 stop it. What are you doing? <laughs> and you can't pull them off. It's like a vice. Yeah. I was trying to like nudge him gently. Nope. Wasn't happening. <laughs> Flick, flick, flick. Ah, no, worst, worst dinosaur ever. Very similar. I had a bird that lived in the tree outside my apartment during grad school. <laughs> and I, there, there were many a morning that if you were to watch the front of my apartment, you would have seen me standing outside of my pajamas, just looking up in a tree angrily, <laughs> holding a you stick. Were like, <laughs> you were like Phoebe's boyfriend in that one episode of Friends. <laughs> where, where he's like, hang on a second. And he, he picks up a gun and shoots the bird out the window. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, I had moments considering to buy a slingshot. Just because <laughs> I was in the middle of writing my thesis. <laughs> the next question. What is your favorite extinct mammal, excluding the obvious, such as saber-toothed cats, mastodons, etc.? I like that this question is, what is your favorite extinct mammal that wasn't part of the original Megazord? Yes, yes. Yep, that is a good way to ask the question. That's a that's a really good question. Mine usually falls. That's why I was happy to to uh, spearhead that episode. It's ground sloths. Yeah, good choice. I like them. They're weird, and they're cool looking, and some of them swam, and I love it. I often go with the most derived things. <laughs> so I don't know for sure. My answer would probably be the early cetaceans. Yeah. Early whales and such. Absolutely. All right. Now, they're narrowing it down further. What is your favorite non-dino, non-croc, and non-snake fossil? Well, you took out all the good ones. <laughs> What's your favorite boring fossil? <laughs> well, let's see. No, 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 no. Um. Well, yeah, what would be my favorite? And we'll say non-mammal, too, because we just did the mammal. Absolutely. What what is my favorite fossil that's not in any of those categories? I I, I got to say that there is a special place in my heart for coiled cephalopods. That's that was high on my list. Yeah, like nautiloids and ammonites. Uh, um what else? What else? What else? Although Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I I mistook the 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 the, the restrictions are very very specific. <laughs> Mosasaurs. <laughs> Mosasaurs, which is almost cheating. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's how close can I get to snakes without answering snakes? No, mo 100% mosasaurs. Like Lizards that are convergent with whales. Yes. There you go. Those, those are my favorites. Or maybe pterosaurs. Pterosaurs are cool too. Yeah, if, if I went with a specific group, there, there's, I love the, the phytosaurs, which once again are just another cheating. group's op <laughs> option to crocs. But if I'm going no. with specific fossil, one of my favorites is the the world tooth shark, the the spiral Ooh. shark tooth helicoprion. Yes, helicoprion, helicoprion, helicoprion. whatever you yeah. want to say. It's, uh, Heliocoptrian. Heli uh, <laughs> helicopteron. <laughs> Transform. Yeah, um, pretty, ah, darn, you're being <laughs> it's what the world is say, for. I'm pretty sure he was one of the Decepticons. <laughs> 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 I love that one because... The if there's a whole printout, you can find tons of it of how they drew the shark trying to figure out where that weird tooth went was yes. hilarious. And it's my favorite <laughs> example of you can't assume that just because you saw one drawing of an animal means that what it that's what it looked like. It's the same reason yep. the goblin shark is my favorite modern shark. <laughs> one more favorite question. What are your favorite invertebrates? Coiled cephalopods. Yeah, good choice. <laughs> Modern cephalopods, too. Insects. Insects. Yeah. Are my number one clade. Cephalopods are close, but no, in, if, you, if you told me I could only study one group of invertebrates, and that was what I had to study ever, insects, 100%. With that question put forward, yeah, and specifically you social. Ooh. I, good. You, I, I love I, hive minds. <laughs> if I had to pick a favorite group of insects, it'd probably be Odonata. The dragonflies. Yep, that's a good one. They're they're pretty cool. Yep, cool. 
Moving on. So outside of favorite things, back to some to hard tack questions. Does this pay off or is it just a labor of love? Mostly it's a labor of love. Yep. Love for science, love for you listeners, <laughs> and love for that guy on the other end of this Skype call. Oh, you. Although it does pay off a little bit now. Kind of. It, it reimburses now, thanks yes. to Patreon. We, we, we break even on our subscriptions and we have enough to do extra little things like getting better mics and yes. uh, getting better equipment and things like that. We are not yet making money on not, the podcast. Not yet. Uh, so we've got Patreon. We've also considered, I meant to mention this earlier, but oh well, we've also considered sponsorship. This is very true. That's That's been something so that's that, kind of hovering around. That might around be something that happens. Yeah. The edges of, of us figuring out if and how we would want to do that. Yeah. We'll see. <gasps> Next question. Do either of you have a dinosaur tattoo? No. No. No tattoos at all. Nope. Not a tattoo kind of guy. Nah, I, I, my, my brother recently, much younger than me, uh, has gotten a tattoo, a huge chest and shoulder tattoo of a space scape with asteroids and scenes from Star Wars. And he's wanting to add another section with other sci-fi movie references. What? <laughs> and it's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and he has a couple of others that he's gotten. Like he loves them and he's gotten some really yeah. cool ones. He is the first one that has made me get close to being like, Oh, you make this look really cool. Yeah, I go big or go home, I guess. But I, I still, I, I just yet to fall in love with one concept. So yeah, David. Yes. What inspired you to go into paleontology and science communication? Oh boy, uh, the <laughs> short version is that uh, paleontology was the one interest that I had as a kid that kept coming back. Like I go through phases, but always paleontology. When I was in 10th grade, 11th grade, 11th grade, I joined Science Olympiad, which was a schools would put teams together to compete in different uh, events. And one of the events they had that year was a fossils event competition. The whole thing was you just learn a bunch about fossils and then you'd have a test. Cool. Like everybody would have a big, you'd walk, go around the room answering questions and see how you did. And I rocked it. Like <laughs> I did so... We were on the B team because we were the new guys, me and my friend Adam, although Adam was mostly there to support me as I was mostly there to hold the wood while he was building his trebuchet <laughs> for his competition. We came in like sixth place out of maybe 30 or 40 some teams. Nice. The A team came in ninth place. Just saying. <laughs> so I did really well and that was really exciting, but mostly I got to the end of it and went, yeah, I could do this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. This This would be great. And then when I went to college, as the years went by, I got more and more experience teaching and doing outreach events and museums and stuff. I found that I loved that even more, even more than I liked learning and researching the stuff. Yes. I liked sharing that information. Yes. So that's how I transitioned from academia into science communication. It's a very similar path for me as well. I, I fell in love with dinosaurs when very young, like many kids do, and it never went away. To to show you how far back things go for me, I no way to know that this was the cause. My first ever birthday cake was an alligator. Uh, I pointed that oh, out. You were you were indoctrinated <laughs> from the start. I pointed that out to my mom <laughs> the other day, and she had forgotten that that's what it was. And I was like, No, I still remember because it was in one of our photo albums. She's like, That could have been it. I was like, I've always assumed it was. <laughs> is that, very nice that was the connection but i fell in love with it uh my 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 catalyst moment was i had a high school teacher named mr donahue who was a a very tough physics and chemistry teacher but extremely re reasonable and fair in the fact that he set out what his expectations were and what the rules were and expected you to follow them and that structure helped me as a student. And then he was an amazing teacher of science. He explained things so well. I, I cannot remember truly being confused in that class. That's like, awesome. It was awesome. And then going on to the Gray Fossil Site and working at the museum and having had some tutoring before that, but getting to be an educator there was what really clicked it. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Absolutely. 
What area of paleontology has you most excited about upcoming discoveries? It's a really good one. I am, for me personally, coloration and yeah. the the how these animals actually looked. The fact that we're getting so many discoveries having to do with that really is exciting me because now when we have visualizations, they are going to be so, so much closer to correct than we have ever been before. Yeah. That's I think that's cool. All all the molecular stuff. Yes. Pigmentation, protein studies, ancient DNA, like that's all still brand new. Mm -hmm. And it's super exciting. Absolutely. Ooh, this is going If you met an evolution skeptic on a train and had two minutes to present your one best piece of evidence for common descent, what would you say? My answer to this is going to be a bit of a cheating answer <laughs> because I don't realistically, if I had two minutes, I wouldn't even try. No, uh, because in my experience, the uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about evolution, especially among people who don't who are anti evolution. Who don't like it. Yeah. And if you're not talking about the same base phenomenon, you're not going to get anywhere in a two minute conversation. So what I would do is I would spend those two minutes trying my best to convince this person to go to certain places where they can find more information. Yes. My two minutes would be spent trying my best to convince them to go to these websites or these places where you can find answers to your questions, you can find introductions to the concepts, because that, if you can spark the curiosity to know about the thing, the rest starts unfolding from there. But Absolutely. you're not, you're not going to get any, the best argument in the world is going to hit a brick wall if the person's not already at the, it hasn't agreed with you upon what evolution even is. Yes. The So that's the, that's my two minutes. The phrase that comes to mind for me, very similar to our to be interesting, you must be interested, which is one of the keys to education. Mm -hmm. Every good educator knows that even if they don't have it in those words, they know that if you're not have excited about it, then they're not going to be excited about it. But on the flip side of that, you cannot teach someone who is unwilling to learn. Yes, you can lead a, an, an anti-evolution person to water, but you cannot make them understand you cannot how natural force them to see that life comes. came from it <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and that's that's you the can key. lead them to the primordial ooze <laughs> but you cannot make them uh, descend from yeah it edu there's because you get that question a lot is how would you convince someone and the answer is i wouldn't on any subject because if i'm having to convince them it's already for naught because yeah. if they are not willing to learn whatever it is i'm presenting then they're not going to learn it. They're not going to hear it. They're not going to process it. They're not going to retain it. I can nope. offer information, but I'm not going to try to actively fight against whatever it is they're thinking. Yeah. You have to convince them to learn about it yes. before you can convince them to accept what they're learning. Yes, absolutely. Will, what is your most entertaining anecdote about a professor or senior scientist? So there's this guy in high school named Mr. Donahue. <laughs> I've heard of that guy. Yeah. He he had a lot. There's a ton I could go through. Uh, just entertaining wise, the list goes on. He just to give you an example, he loved to stand out in the hallways whenever it was about to snow because we lived up in North Georgia, and people up there freaked out if there was going to be any. This is Georgia, so we never got snow, snow, but yeah. we got like two inches. What's this? And after that snow came down the grocery stores would be cleared out of bottled water and bread. <laughs> and so he would stand in the hallway and yell, whenever snow was announced, he would just sit in the hallway and yell, bread and water, bread and water. Because <laughs> he thought it was ridiculous. But my, oh, that's funny. As far as being a teacher goes, my favorite moment, because I had him for three years out of high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went through the intros, and then I did the advanced, our closest we had to an AE uh physics class just for seniors and in there he he kind of started to reveal a lot of his tips and tricks one of the things he did is when he taught you how to multiply a fraction is that you must invert the fraction and then multiply them together mm -hmm. that's how you multiply fractions to get you to remember it because he had a lot of these tricks he didn't have those things like take the first letter he had really funny things his was invert and multiply live long and prosper and then you had to hold up the spock sign because huh. it goes together and you don't forget it. I still remember it to this day. 
Now, <laughs> he could not hold his pinky in. His fingers wouldn't quite do that. So he would put a marker in between his two fingers to hold them yeah. apart. <laughs> and then we got to senior class and he went to say it again. He's like, you all remember? And rolled to invert and multiply to live long and prosper. And then he did the signal with no marker. And we all noticed. And yeah. we were like, what? And he went up oh, and put a marker in. And then he explained, he goes, yeah, I can do it. Just by me doing that forces no one else to not do it. Now no one has an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> it forces us all to participate. That sounds like a cool person. It was, uh, and that, it, it clicked for me where it's like everything you do is making sure that we are learning it as best we can. <laughs> yeah. It was cool. Wow. So yeah, there we go. Next question. Is there a place in paleontology for GIS specialists? Yes, there is. Uh, GIS is... Oh, we had the same conversation in the live stream and I never looked it up. <laughs> I'd say geospatial imaging system, something like that. It, mapping. You're, you're, you're mapping things out. You're, you're looking at the spatial arrangement of things. Uh, absolutely, there are tons of people who do GIS work in paleo now. There are endeavors now to map out fossil sites across the countries. The con yeah, the countries. There, uh, if you look up paleo map, there the the marking of the geographic locations of various fossil sites across North America, and people will use that in their that data in their studies to see you know how were things distributed. We can learn about uh, a large scale climatic effects on the smaller scale. We did GIS work at the Gray Fossil Site. Yes, we did mapping the location of each specific fossil found on the site to see what does that tell us about the the ancient environment here and how things were arranged so there yeah there's all sorts of gis work that that is done when i was in undergraduate in my geology class we learned to use arcgis for one of our big projects i have since forgotten what i learned about arcgis <laughs> but yeah, so if you're interested in doing, if you look up paleontology GIS, you will find lots of examples of that. Absolutely. Hey, Will. Yeah? What was the weirdest slash most awkward thing someone asked you at your job? Something that left you really baffled? I love this question. I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a, a like truly like just weird or awkward. I have definitely a number of moments that I, rem I remember more acutely. A lot of them were my breaking down the preconceptions I had of what is and isn't common sense, which yeah. is coming from a, I'm a student, I'm a student. It's really hard not to realize that tons of these things, no one else knows other yeah. than other people who went through my same background. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is when I got first got asked if snakes had bones. Cause I didn't yes. know that was a thing that people thought. Yep. I did it. Very know. common question actually. Yeah. And nowadays it's not weird at all. Probably one of the weirdest ones for me just because what I had no clue there was this level of disconnect between science and, and certain people. It's not actually a judgment on this person. I just was completely caught off guard by it was we were at an outreach. We had a rhino skull on the table. Someone came up and pointed at it and was like, oh, that's a, like a dinosaur triceratops, which people did all the time. It was a yes. big skull. They assume dinosaur because it's fossil. That's normal. Yep. And it's... It doesn't look like T-Rex, so they go with a, the next big head dinosaur they know. Yeah, and it's got that flaring yeah, in the back. So exactly. It's not too dissimilar. Not ridiculous, but this this person said that, and I went, no, it's a rhino, actually, not a dinosaur. You know, that's a, a rhino, and they looked at me like they, because they had just, they were like, that's a dinosaur. And I was like, no, rhino. And they looked at me like, yeah. I was like, no, rhinos are mammals. <laughs> and they went, they still gave me that look of, yeah. I went, mammals aren't dinosaurs. And they went, oh. <laughs> and that was yeah. that not a direct judgment on this person because there's no reason they need to know that information necessarily for their job. But I was so unprepared for that level of disconnect. I had no more response. I just sat there like, <laughs> I don't know what else to say to you. I just, do you know what birds are? I don't know where to go from here. I was so caught <laughs> off guard. It threw me off my game completely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to forget. It, it, it's hard to remember. It's easy to forget what... What is the stuff you've learned? Yes. Because you've been doing this forever. That's the same thing you have when you mention a, a celebrity and someone goes, who? And you go, you don't know who Blank is? So yes. yeah, I don't watch their movies, so I don't know. <laughs> yep, 100%. Yep. 
That's like the seventeenth time I've said hundred percent. I'm stopping. <laughs> That's the last one. <laughs> so, next question. Oh, this is a fun one. If you could get any one animal included in the next Jurassic Park movie, what would it be? Oh boy. Well, I mean, <laughs> for me, I gotta stay on brand. So it would be super cool to get some of those Cretaceous marine snakes. That would be a lot of fun. Um, I think that Paleozoic creatures, it'd be really cool to get get Paleozoic stuff some some attention. But it's Jurassic Park, so we're sticking with the Mesozoic. Yeah. Uh, ancient birds would be really cool. That would. Like like toothed birds, like an Ichthyornith or Hesperornis yes. would be really neat. But uh, if, if, if I'm not being picky, I would settle for literally anything discovered within the last 30 years yeah that that would be cool to see something in a, in a jurassic park movie yeah i got i got mine but not in a movie to show how how nerdy i am with this subject the lost world video game has a session where you have to fight a dinosuchus on a boardwalk uh <gasps> yes it does i remember that and so i was completely oh, wow. happy forever <laughs> no. I know. Man, wow. Right? That's one of those things. I forgot about that completely until you just said it, and I remember that being awesome. I love shooter arcades, and I stand to this day that the Lost World shooter arcade game is one of the best ever. The final fight has you within the abandoned town being chased by the male and female T Rex through the town, <laughs> and it's awesome because you're in the dark and they like slowly emerge from the shadows through the trees as they're chasing down your car it's it's the best good stuff good game will yes what what is the strangest thing you've found in the field a horse tooth yes i remember that yes so this is not a weird thing in and of itself it's not like i found a, a super weird version of something it's a pretty recognizable bone like there's lots and lots of these in collections all over the world from this, mm-hmm. the age we were at, this was at the Gray Fossil Site. But the Gray Fossil Site does not have very much horse material. In fact, we had three pieces of horse material at that time, two toes and a tooth. I yes. have now found <laughs> a quarter of the material that we have. <laughs> I found another tooth. And the reason it was the weirdest for me is everything came to a grinding halt. And they gave me a tiny, tiny little sculpting tool and said, keep digging there for the rest of the day to see if we <laughs> can find more. Now. And we didn't find anything. And so the level of, <gasps> to the level of, oh, was so <laughs> drastic. <laughs> At the end of the day, Wally walked back up and was like, anything? Like, no. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and it was never to be. <laughs> and then that was... The only horse material we ever found while I was digging there. <laughs> so, Good find, though. Yeah. Oh, super exciting. Very cool. Um, David. Yes. What is your favorite yogurt? <laughs> I love the, 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 the array of questions it's that we so got much here. Fun. It's great. I do not actually eat yogurt. Um, I don't. I think the last time I ever actually ate yogurt was when I was a kid. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I don't. I have not had yogurt in a long, long time. I don't have any preference. I don't eat a lot of it, but I like it when there's crunchy stuff in it. Gross. You're gross. I like it with crunchy stuff. Do you all remember? You all listen. I bet you like chunky peanut butter. We're not. We're not. No. Orange juice with the. Pulp is great. With the pulp in it. Pulp is great. No, it's not. We're not talking to Dave anymore. Listeners, do you remember when you were a kid? That's pulp fiction. (laughs) Shut up. I'm talking to you guys now. You're cool. <laughs> Do you remember? I'm actually looking at my mic. I, I yeah, literally yeah, no, you are. You're staring at your mic. You, uh, camera one. You Look at me. Eyes here. <laughs> Do you remember those yogurts when you were a kid that had the stuff in the lid? The like pieces of like Oreo crumble and like yep. things like that. And you'd peel it off and you'd put it on and you'd shake it around. Those are the best. That is a lie. <laughs> you are lying to our listeners. <laughs> you're, a, you're a liar. <laughs> This person asks, I'm sitting in a 300 million year old swamp. You've got great internet connection. For sitting in a 300 million year old swamp. That's pretty cool. What can you tell me about the transition from amphibians to early reptiles? Oh, bunches, and we will happily tell you more in an episode because that would be a very fun topic. 
that yeah it's on the list yeah and and surprisingly enough was not something that we thought of right away like a lot of people asked us for cool transition stuff that was not something we were thinking of a bunch for whatever reason I, actually yeah we put a bunch of transitions down on our initial list the list mm-hmm. that we made and that was not that wasn't that like, was not what... when this person suggested that i went to the list and went, did we miss that <laughs> yeah we, we didn't put that in right there. so yes <laughs> There's some cool stuff there, you know, the development of eggshells and scaly skin and claws and all that good stuff. So, I mean, you get you get cool stuff there. I can't give you the specifics right now because I don't have that in my head to where I can give you a really good answer. Yeah, and we'll do it. We'll put that in there. Absolutely. Someday. And you get cool stuff there where it's like these animals, as we've talked about before, where it's like, are you a lizard or a big salamander? Because you yeah. move like a <laughs> lizard. But we're pretty sure you're actually still kind of an amphibian. But cool stuff. <laughs> Big beefy salamanders that walked around and ate stuff. <laughs> Next question. Are you interested in interviews and or information from scientists hearing your podcast? Our listener says, in my opinion, sharing our research is very important. A hundred. Oh, I don't even <laughs> say it. I get on a. I get 99%. On a, on a tra- I, that's the joke I was going to make. <laughs> I, I, my plan was to make that joke. <laughs> Your brain went, your brain autocorrected and, and went, you, yeah, missed you missed a percentage. You missed a percentage. I'm sorry. You forgot uh, that. We are 110% interested <laughs> in hearing. Yeah, yeah. We, we would love to hear from scientists. We've actually had a bunch of our listeners who shared their research with us. And then sometimes we will report it on the podcast. Yes. It's fun. Um, we can't promise doing interviews necessarily. Because, uh, yeah, no, we don't want to say we'll do interviews and then everybody starts sending us their stuff. Yeah. But... I think that at the very least, a starting point is if you want to share your research on like our Facebook page, make a post on the Facebook page and show people, you know, tell people about your research. Like it'd be cool to have a community there. Absolutely. Where people can interact, share it with us on Twitter. We'll retweet it. You know, we would love to share that information around. Uh, and, and sometimes that will inspire us to to talk about certain things on the podcast as has happened before absolutely so if we can be a a part of the outlet that our scientific listeners can use to get the word out about their research definitely we will share share that info with us we'd love to hear it will Mm -hmm. next question how would you recommend an early career researcher get involved in science communication This person adds, much to our humility, Mm -hmm. how can I learn to be as good a communicator as you both? Oh, shut up. Shucks. Oh, stop it. (laughs) You. Uh, This is is a good question, and there's there's no one answer, because there's one of the things I try to emphasize whenever you're starting a career, there are so many different paths to a career in a field. In paleontology, you have artists who are now part of the paleontological community you have scientists of course but you have geologists biologists you have people who are more interested in weather or plants than they were in any of the other parts of it and so there's never one way for if you're if you're looking to get a start in this the the biggest and best thing to lead you is stick with things that you are interested with stick with something that 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 keeps your energy up, that you are excited to talk about or to learn about and definitely to discuss if you're looking to get into SCICOM. Because if you aren't, then it's it's going to wear thin at some point. At some point down the line, you're going to hit a moment where you're just tired of it. And so, yeah. fall, fall, you know, as, as cliche and as, as wishy-washy as it sounds, following your passion is really important when you're doing something that can be as tedious as public outreach which can sometimes be very grinding you don't Mm -hmm. always have good interactions with just the general public and research which is by its nature tedious and time consuming because it's meticulous yeah i would add to that that if you're trying to get into psycom especially if you're a researcher know your audience yes Uh, because and and because you probably don't know your audience as well as you think you do and i say this as somebody who didn't know my audience as well as I thought I did. And Will's over there not knowing that people didn't know what dinosaurs did. Yeah. It's very easy to not realize what your audience knows and what your audience is interested in. 
And the best way to get to know your audience is to talk to them. Yes. Uh, if you want to get started in SciComm, go start doing, you know, go to museums, you know, do do whatever whatever outlet you're most comfortable in. If you listen to a lot of podcasts and that inspires you to be a podcaster, be a podcaster. This was super easy to start. Absolutely. Like the hardest part about starting this was doing it. That that I would say that that if I were going to give one bit of advice for how to get started in SciComm, it would be make a plan. That's yep. Who do you want to reach? What is it you want to accomplish? Make that plan first, and then do it. The doing it part is the hardest part. You have to once stick you to get it. started, the ball's rolling. What well, that's the hardest part. Make a plan, figure out what you want to do, and do it. And look to other people for inspiration if you need to. We we have we have pulled nearly sleepless nights to make sure that we do not fall behind and or miss the schedule that we have set for ourselves to make sure that we don't accidentally start shirking on the podcast and the plan <laughs> we set for ourselves. And I I I, I was getting that even before that. Yeah, because that's something because. That's but, something that we do. I don't want to put people off. No, no, the, but, uh, but saying that <laughs> the, the you, scent. you have to stick with whatever it is you decide to do. Like you have to, yeah, you have to keep doing it, you know, or else it's not really a, a thing that's going to keep going unless it's con it's continuous and regular. Which ties back to what you said. Make sure it's something you're going to enjoy. Yes, because without to what that, you like. with with that, it makes it so much easier. <laughs> and the other thing that I would mention is. There are a bajillion people out there willing to help. You don't have to do it alone. If you run into an issue, if you run into a problem, if you need help, ask somebody. It's one of the lovely Email things. Email us at commondescentpodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> We'd love to talk to you about what you want to do. Yes, definitely. All right. <coughs> so, David, any yes. chance of an episode on cetaceans? Yes. Stay tuned. <laughs> Boom. Will, what is the most fun or exciting career path? In paleontology, how common are academic jobs versus non-academic jobs? Really good question. Uh, most exciting and fun is going to be different depending on who you ask, uh, especially for the fun aspect. What, you know, another researcher finds fun. I might not find fun, especially the research part. It was, for me, very much a trial because I, I distracted yeah. very easily. It's very <laughs> tedious. But... For exciting, there's definitely probably some more substantial comparisons you can make. The people who have to, you know, go cave diving to reach the stuff that they're going to have to find. It's pretty cool. That's pretty exciting. That's, that's definitely a level of adrenaline that we're not going to be experiencing. <laughs> Just <laughs> re relaxing under the shade at Gray Fossil Site. The people who get to be on documentaries. But that's, that's pretty cool. Could be anyone. So that's not to say that that's <laughs> yeah. one career. I've seen people I know on documentaries. So there's definitely some out there that are high octane by comparison. Yes. The, how common are academic versus non-academic jobs? Very much on both sides. Yeah. There's a lot of options for both. On the academic side, research is always necessary. It's what keeps it being a science. Yeah. And it's not as... It's not as rare as I think some people think it is. It's still competitive. There's not a ton of yes. positions. But no, it's it's definitely feasible to do it. Well, and there's there's lots there's lots of people who are academic in the field even if they aren't currently employed by a university or museum. Yeah. You can do research even if you aren't hired as a professor. Just means you're not getting paid to do that directly necessarily. You may have to have a grant or you may have to have enough free time outside of whatever you do to make yeah. money to do it. But there's lots of people who have made really awesome discoveries in their own free time doing good science. But there's lots of non-academic jobs. Ours would classify as we're not researching. We are doing... Yeah. A, a, we're not an institution. No. We're doing outreach. We're doing outreach on our own, in our own style. You get a lot of those paleo artists often fall into this category because you get a lot who are doing, trying to represent the research, but also trying to portray the animals in interesting and, and, you know, uplifting ways of things that make you actually really enjoy looking at it. You know, they're making art that is yep. based on science. Uh, so there's a lot on both sides. There's a lot of weird ones. Yeah. 
I work museums, in museums. I yes. would add to that. Yes, that, that's probably the big non-academic area is that there's a lot of ways to be in museums. Uh, you could working in the collections, working in the lab, working in the educational aspect yeah, of it. Guides. Tour guides, uh, program people. Mm-hmm. You know, you can coordinate the programs. You can do outreach. There are uh, outside of museums. There's all sorts of ways to get involved in the teaching aspect or the PR aspect. So there's all sorts of almost anything you can do in another career path. Yes, that's exactly there's, what I was about to say. I I have a I know somebody who has was a marketing person. Yes, for a, for a paleo department that is now getting into research. Yes, so immersed that she's now getting into research. Things like that. You need people who are architects to design the gallery that's going to hold your fossils, and engineers yeah. to design the apertures that are going to hold or you know do you want a 3d cg dinosaur to show kids on a display you better get someone who's a 3d artist <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. the those it's, gis people yes it, it spider webs out very quickly it does cool all right we had to get this one out of the way eventually how many times do you think you've exclaimed yeah only as many times as there has been something cool to respond <laughs> yeah to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly <laughs> as many times as has been necessary. It's it's definitely... Even after we made the comment at the very beginning, and I've even been trying to say where it yet, it, yeah is a very yeah. good expressive word, yeah. and it... <laughs> There was a time, the first couple episodes, everything was cool. Cool. I remember that, like, everything was cool. I used to say basically a hundred times an episode. Mm -hmm. uh, It's it's tough. Now, now, uh, a lot of the yes, I think we are, we're trying to say it less and we're trying to edit it out more. Yep. That's the key. (laughs) So it's, it's a two-pronged We may not say it less, but you're never going to hear it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah. This is the final question of our Q&A. What is your dream project, scientific or otherwise? I'm so glad this was the final question. It's so This perfect. worked out really well, actually. It worked actually. out really well. <laughs> uh, what, is our, what is my dream project, uh, scientific or otherwise? You're listening to it. Yep. This, this is... It, when we first started this, I had... And I really think it was when we got our first, res, like, first downloads and first correspondence, like within our first three episodes because it was fun from the get-go and we both knew that it was something that we wanted to do (laughs) hundred percent (laughs) hundred percent it was hundred percent fun we both knew it was something we wanted to do but as soon as we started getting some of the response and feedback i had a light bulb moment that immediately clicked on and it just instantly i i had the thought this is what i want to do this is what i want to do now Yep. And until I'm done doing stuff, <laughs> like it's, it's just clicked so well. And it's been, a, it's amazes me constantly how almost not effortlessly, because it, we, we put a lot of effort into making it quality, into doing it well, but how smoothly it has transitioned into next phases of, yes. of what we want to do next and what we want to branch into. It has never been a, pulling of a tooth process to try to do something new uh so yeah it's this and the things we do in association with it uh yeah i think that this and and as i've often said i don't think that the podcast is in its final form nope and in fact i don't know that our final form will even be a podcast or at least not a podcast by itself very true but whatever we end up doing like we like like we said earlier there are a few things that we are now thinking about doing that we weren't necessarily thinking about doing, but even though that wasn't the original plan, I'm now super excited about it because I know the audience wants it. Yes. And that goes back to the thing I said before, know your audience. Mm -hmm. And for us, the exciting part is knowing that we are communicating and reaching an audience and people are really are listening in and really appreciating what we're doing that's the exciting part for me. I love being able to reach people like that. We've had people get back to us. You know, some people have kind words. 
Some people say this is really cool. They, they, I really like it. There's a lot of those personal touches where people, yeah. you know, one of our patrons actually, who says that they fall asleep or no, no, they, that they try to go to sleep listening to the podcast, but they can't because they, they get so engaged in it. Yeah. That's awesome. We had somebody join SVP. Yes. Tell us that we inspired them to join the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, which means we might meet that person at a meeting. That's I know. so cool. That that level of connection, it doesn't have to be the podcast. It could be live streaming. It could be what it, live appearances, you know, traveling to, to schools, like we said before. Whatever it is that's allowing us to do that, it's... that's, oh, man. True. Plus, plus more snakes. That would be the dream. <laughs> if I could do that while holding a snake. <laughs> yeah. That's yes. The... Yes. I could actually. I could yes. technically be you doing could. that right now. I, if I, I want it. could do it while holding an alligator, but I wouldn't have a job the next <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't be allowed around the kids. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd have to get it from the aquarium. So, you know, that'd be pretty bad. <laughs> it's this, this has been so far and continues to be just so much so much fun first off we enjoy getting to do this we love getting to hear from the people who are enjoying it and to be able to have engaging conversations with the people who this is reaching whether it's questions whether it's uh just we've had just nonsense comment conversations that are just just enjoyable and then there's been yeah. times where people have come on to say i noticed you said this and I always thought this, or I feel, and being able to have, if not debates, because I feel like that term is thrown around too often. No, but, but discussions, discussions, learning moments, you know, teaching moments, teaching moments on both sides. We have learned from the people who listen to us a number yes. of times. And it's, yep, yep. yeah, it's, it's just rewarding on all levels. And I love it. And that, what a perfect circle. Yeah. Back to the topic of thanking our listeners for doing the survey. The survey was... One of the most enjoyable moments of validation for us that people respond that people are actually listening. People have opinions. People have suggestions about what we're doing. Very cool. Thank you again, everybody, for participating in the survey, for asking us these wonderful questions. This was <laughs> super fun. Really, really was. As soon as we saw people started answering these, we were like, we got, we're going to have to do a Q&A yep. episode now. That's every time one come up, I was like... Oh, that that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one, too. Oh, I really <laughs> want to go over that one. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so very much for submitting these questions. If you liked this format, if you liked the Q&A thing, let us know. We'll do it again. Yeah. We would love – this was super fun. We'll, we would love to do this. Absolutely. I, I wanted to say I, I have been saying absolutely about as much as you've been saying 100%. So 100%. 100% absolutely talk to us <laughs> yeah <laughs> i noticed it after you pointed that out i was like i think that's i think that's been about equivalent here there's only so many response words that you could do we're gonna have to start making up words. we're just gonna we have to start that. yelling just oh no oh. oh. goodness gracious <laughs> <laughs> so we might be back to do more of this anytime you have questions let us know maybe we'll put out a call for like a mailbag I, yeah, at some point. that's every, what I was every thinking. Every six is, months or something, we could put out a call and, and ask collect them up and do this again. Because as always, so tell us fun. what you like, what you want to hear more of, what you want us to do, and to the best of our abilities and time and money, we will do it. Always and always. I think that's it for now. I think this podcast episode is a hundred percent done. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> This joke, this joke ends with the outro music, <laughs> just... and the outro music plays now. <laughs> one episode, one episode joke. <laughs>you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.